Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of the City Club, and I welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio or watching on cable television. Thank you for joining us for this week's Friday Forum on this, the 12th of June, 2009. Today we will hear a remarkable story of a journey out of poverty by the person who made the journey, along with lessons that can be drawn about how our society can help others successfully make that very difficult life transition. But first, some announcements. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, I ask everybody in the room, if you haven't already done so, to please turn off your cell phones or other devices that may make noise. As always, we will offer appreciation to our Friday Forum corporate sponsors, without whose generous financial support these time-honored City Club Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our initial corporate sponsor for this quarter is the law firm of Stoll Reeves LLP. We thank Stoll Reeves for its support. And if your company or firm would like to be a sponsor of our Friday Forums or of our nationally recognized citizen-driven research program, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the club office. City Club's popular Citizen Salon Dinner and Discussion Series continues on Thursday, June 25th with an evening addressing the topic, Portland's Bridges to the Future, Pragmatism versus Inspiration. Hear what guest provocateur, urban design critic, and Portland Spaces editor-in-chief Randy Gregg will have to say about the bridges that are being planned for construction across the Willamette and Columbia Rivers and why we need to get the design for those bridges right. To make a reservation for this and other upcoming Citizen Salon dinners, go to the City Club website, call the club office, or check the club's bulletin. If you're a member of City Club and have not yet made uh, plans to do so, uh, please attend this year's City Club annual meeting on June 23rd. Note that the annual meeting of the membership of City Club this year will not be held here at the Governor Hotel on a Friday noon, which has been our tradition, but rather, <coughs> excuse me, rather we're gonna have a special evening event on Tuesday, June 23rd at the Ecotrust Building in the Pearl District. Also note that this year, unlike in prior years, the meeting will actually have two parts. During the first part of the meeting, we will uh, vote on our slate of candidates for officers and members of the Board of Governors, and also will honor those who have made special contributions to the club and to the community. But during the second half of the meeting, we will have a group discussion and individualized computer keypad voting on a number of important questions about City Club and its future that have arisen out of the club's strategic planning process this year. Now, special reservations are necessary to attend the annual meeting. Uh, in, uh, again, it's on June 23rd at the Ecotrust Building. Check the club website or the bulletin for more details or call the club office. It should make for a um, fun and engaging evening for all members, and we do encourage you to attend if you can. Next week here at the Friday Forum on June 19th, Oregon Congressman Peter DeFazio will discuss his views on the proposed national cap and trade system for addressing climate change. Now his views on that approach are more critical than many, so it should make for a provocative presentation. As the chair of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee, Congressman DeFazio's views on pending federal legislation for highway and transit funding are well worth noting also, and we expect him to discuss his views on those subjects as well. That's next week here at the Friday Forum. And now for today's program. Living in today's economy, almost all of us are more mindful than perhaps we've ever been in our lifetimes of the tenuous nature of economic well-being as laborers, as employees, as professionals, business owners, and even investors. We're experiencing what it's like to feel economically insecure as individuals, as parents, and as family members. For most of us, however, not all of us, but for most of us, we have family and early adult childhood backgrounds if not affluence, at least fairly stable working class or middle class family lives to draw on for personal grounding, for support and role models, for lessons learned, and for family and community connections. So imagine what it would be like to come of age without this kind of background, with rather a family history not of economic stability and security, but rather of poverty and economic insecurity and not just in your family of origin, but going back two or more generations 
to what those who study such things call generational poverty. Now, if you're a young adult with that kind of background, how do you manage to achieve a better life? What is it like to actually attempt it and to accomplish it when you simply do not have the same means and the same access to resources as do others with a different family background? And how in God's name do you do this in this kind of economy when everyone seems to be either struggling or feeling insecure and when opportunities for holding your own, much less making personal advancement, are hard for everybody? Well, today we at City Club are very fortunate to have as our speaker a person who can and will tell us firsthand what it is like to find one's way out of so-called generational poverty to achieve personal success. And in so doing, our speaker will help us understand what our society can and should be considering, if not doing, to enable others to successfully make the same journey she has made. Although our speaker's presentation will include significant information about her own life, let me just give you some of the basics. She grew up as a child of generational poverty, as I've described above. She left uh, school for marriage at age 15. By age 25, she found herself divorced, homeless, with two kids, and without a high school diploma. However, she earned her GED, continued her studies, and ultimately earned her PhD in educational leadership at Portland State in 2000. At PSU, our speaker taught speech communications courses for eight years. She since has become a national public speaker, discussion leader, and trainer, and is the author of See Poverty, Be the Difference, a resource book for professionals who work with people in poverty. She currently is president of the firm Communications Across Barriers, a consulting firm that works to improve communication and relationships across class, race, gender, and generational barriers. Our speaker also is the founder and CEO of a new nonprofit called Poverty Bridge, which is dedicated to changing lives for members of our society in poverty. I'm very pleased to introduce, and I ask you to help me welcome, for the first time to our City Club microphone, Dr. Donna Beagle. Donna? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here at City Club in my own hometown. And I do consider this my hometown, even though when people say to me, where'd you grow up? I usually say Arizona, Oregon, Washington, California. Because my family were primarily migrant labor workers. My grandparents were cotton pickers. My parents were cotton pickers. And my family survived by following the fruit season. So we'd leave Arizona sometime about April and head to California, Oregon, and uh, Washington, picking cherries, strawberries, beans, uh, onions, potatoes, grapes. Uh, sometimes we would live up in the woods near Tillamook and pull moss from the trees and bale it and sell it to nurseries. Sometimes it was pine cones. Um, sometimes it was bark, depending upon where we lived. But when you come from generational poverty, those are the kinds of jobs that you can get. And most of my family members are not literate. I travel a ton, and I was recently sitting on a plane talking to my seat partner, who told me that there are no illiterate people in America. I tried to convince him to come to my house for a karaoke party that Sunday I was happen having, because most of my family members are still not literate. Um, and it's not an issue that we often talk about or even think about in the United States of America. I was talking to a couple of businessmen uh, from one from Poland, one from Russia. And they said to me at the City Grill here in Portland, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I work on poverty issues. And both of them kind of looked taken aback and said, in America? And I said, well, yes. And then they kind of chuckled and said, must not be too busy. <laughs> Sit down, guys. So I gave them a few facts about poverty in the United States of America, and both of them said to me, no one would believe you. If you went anywhere in the world, no one would believe you because America sends the message that it takes care of its people. According to the census, we have 38 million Americans who live in the crisis condition of poverty. 38 million. And I just read a recent uh, statistic for Oregon, one in five children in Oregon can't afford school lunch. One in five. Can you imagine anybody here have five kids or no five kids? Pick the one that doesn't get to have. 
And if they don't know how to fill out the paperwork because of illiteracy, who might help navigate that for them? So I do bring a little bit different perspective to the subject of poverty. Most of the folks who talk about poverty are folks who haven't experienced it. And I come from the deepest poverty, which is generational poverty. When I was studying at the University of Portland, I started looking into the issue of poverty because I came to University of Portland believing that people who were making it simply didn't care about people who weren't. And I had gotten those messages from my experiences growing up. For example, uh, my parents would go into some organization to ask for help. And almost always, between them and the people they were asking was plastic or glass. And as a kid, I remember thinking, uh, you know, I must have bad parents because people won't even talk to them face to face, let alone get to know our family and what's going on with us. I remember being a seventh grader at a really high poverty school and telling a teacher, I don't want to go on the playground. There are fights out there. And the teacher said to me, I have work to do. There's nothing I can do. Go on out. 20 minutes later, I was in the principal's office with big handfuls of my hair falling out. No one cares. You get those messages very, very strong. So that's how I entered the University of Portland. And it was really, for me, my first time being around people who were making it. So I began having conversations with folks, and it became clear real quick. They cared. Let me see a show of hands in this audience. How many of you care about the people who live in the crisis condition of poverty in Oregon and in America and around the world? We care. We care. So I started, I started asking people what they knew about poverty. And it became really clear really quick that they didn't have a clue. They had, had no concept of what our family was experiencing on a daily basis. So I started looking for K-12 curriculum. Surely we're teaching kids about poverty because it is one of the most empowering things you can do for children in poverty and children not in poverty. For the ones in poverty, it helps them to see that there are real, real causes for poverty, and it's not their personality. For the ones who aren't in poverty, it helps them to build empathy. Let me give you an example. I was talking to a group of kindergartners, and I said to them, what do you think it might feel like if you didn't have a place to sleep tonight? What would that be like? And this little girl drew me a house, and she said to me, this is the one-cent hotel. It's for all the people who have no place to sleep tonight. Because you know the number two reason kids drop out of school is being ridiculed, humiliated for their shoes, their backpack, not having the right food, the right lunch, not knowing the words to use. All through school, I didn't know the words the teachers were using. And I would ask, most kids start out askers, I would ask, I would say, what does that word mean? And my teachers would say, you need to be responsible and independent. I'm not going to enable you. Go look it up in the dictionary. So I'd go to the dictionary and look it up, and I'd find five more words I didn't know. And that would be equated to my IQ and to my learning potential. Do you know how overrepresented our kids in poverty in Oregon and in this nation are in special education? And many times what you find is the measurement for placing them in special education is do they know middle class stuff? Do they know middle class vocabulary? Have they had middle class experiences? Because for me, it wasn't only the vocabulary I didn't know. I didn't know the subject matter they were using. So they would talk about things like Watergate or something, and I would say, what's Watergate? And usually responses to those kinds of questions to me were, how can you not know that? Aren't you American? I don't know why I don't know. I, everybody else seems to know it. I, I must be dumb. It's really the only conclusion that you can come to in a country where we don't educate people about poverty and its real causes and impacts. So I found we're not teaching it in K-12. Even though, just like teaching a child, if you teach an African-American child, a Native American child, their history, it empowers them to contextualize their current experiences. The same is true about poverty. We've got to teach our kids about poverty. When I work with middle school kids, I like to have them go out in their community and find out how many people in your community are getting their water shut off every day. 
How many people in your community are getting their lights shut off every day? It's typically around 350 families a day and triple for the utilities. So in my family, water shutoffs, utility shutoffs was very, very normal. It was so normal to have, oh, they've been here and now we have no water and we have to make do. It was so normal when my son was seven years old, he walked in the room one day and he stomped his foot and he said, Mom, guess what happened now? And I said, what, Daniel? He said, Mom, they shut my lights out. He took me into his bedroom. And the truth was his light bulb had burned out. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine a child from privilege having that as a frame of reference? Um, but for my world of generational poverty, that was normal. When you're making choices between the rent and the food, utilities, car insurance, garbage service are way, way out there on the luxury list. I and mean, we always had garbage. And I hear people say, well, just because you're poor, you don't have to have garbage. Where are we going to put it? Because I remember so many times, we tried to take it like to an apartment complex and get it in the dumpster. And then we'd get caught, and they would fine us, and my mom's Dunkin' Donut check would be going to pay the fines. So having those honest, authentic conversations can't happen without education. So I started looking at, well, surely, surely we're teaching poverty in higher ed. Now let me ask you this question. How many people in this room have had the course, History of Poverty, United States of America? I usually have audiences of thousands, and I see not one hand. How many of you can finish this sentence? If we don't know our history, we are? That's what's happening. Today in America, a child born into poverty is less likely to become educated than they were in the 1940s. We haven't improved. It's gotten worse. Some of the ways that people made it out of poverty no longer exist. Some of those jobs that actually paid a living wage without higher education or being an electrician or a plumber, automated, globalized. So the kinds of jobs that my family could get being illiterate or barely functionally literate were jobs where you would make choices between rent and food. I moved to Oregon when I was 14. That was when we moved here for good. We didn't leave again. And I moved on 103rd and Southeast Yukon. And I don't know if you've been to outer Southeast Portland, um, but that road, Yukon, it kind of has the bumpy road. Like, I mean, you surely wouldn't want to bring your car down there unless you wanted to lose your muffler kind of road. Uh, but this uh, house that we moved into was a, it was a one bedroom house. It didn't have plumbing. The roof was falling in. And at that time, being 14, I used to think, how do we do it? No matter what town we go to, rural town, big city, we find the ghetto. We don't even have a map. How do we do that? Now, of course, I know the answer. Um, those are the only people that would rent to us because we had evictions on our history, we had bad credit, we had temporary seasonal kinds of jobs, and my dad would stand out there and he'd say to the landlord, oh, don't worry about that no plumbing, I'm gonna fix that up, I'm a handyman. Anybody ever done remodeling? Think we're gonna fix it? <laughs> You know, it's expensive. We're not going to fix it. We've got to duct tape it. It's going to get worse and we're going to move. Or we'll move because the utility bills are so high. And people will say, how could you have a $500 electric bill? Because in our house, the ice is on the inside of the windows. <laughs> Those experiences shape you. So I, I really started looking into higher ed and, and trying to find curriculum where we were teaching people about the history of poverty. Uh, most people don't know in the Pennsylvania area in the 1700s, they made a law against poverty. They did. They said you have to wear a pee on your sleeve when you leave your home. It has to be, three, it has to be four inches. It has to be red or blue. Because the thinking in the 1700s was, if they could embarrass you enough, you quit acting poor. Herbert Gons, in his book, War on the Poor, he says, we keep asking people in poverty to act middle class. And when they don't, we punish them. What do we do to students in Portland schools 
who are late to school, who live in the crisis condition of poverty. What happens to our students who are late? I was working with one school and a teacher said to me, you got to help me with this kid. She said, I've tried everything I know and I, it's not working. And I said, well, tell me what kinds of things you've tried. She said, well, I took away recess. I took away his, uh, he's not allowed to participate in extracurricular activities or athletics. And he's still late every day and won't do his homework. What do you call homework when you don't have a home? So I said to her, what's going on with this guy? He's 10 years old. She said, I don't know. I said, let's find him. We found him. He was living in the back of a pickup truck with his grandpa. And every day for seven months of the school year, that kid had gotten up and got to school. And when he got there, he was hammered. That school decided that their action plan for addressing poverty in their schools, one, of, one action they would take is they would change their tardy slips to we're glad you're here slips. And in my 90-day follow-up with that school, everyone, the teachers, the front office staff, the parents, the students, the administrators, talked about what a climate shift, what a, a, a school climate shift when people came in and were welcomed I mean, could you imagine if I took you all, uh, had the power to take you all to Baghdad right now? And you were, uh, whatever you do here, you do it in Baghdad. And if you're working with families in, in, in uh, maybe fighting poverty here, you would be doing that there. Or if you're educating, or if you're health care. Could you imagine what someone might say if a family, kids, adults, made it past the landmines and the suicide bombings and the horrific shootings and all of the things that are going on there, can you imagine them making it into the, to the social service organization? What, what someone might say to them? You're late. You need to reschedule. Or to the kid, where's your homework? You can't come in the classroom, you don't have your backpack. The thing about poverty that we need to be clear about is poverty feels like war. That's why, woven throughout the literature on poverty, there's the metaphor of war all throughout that literature. Because when you watch people you love not have their fundamental needs met, not, my brother Wayne, his entire mouth is full of super glue. That's how he makes his teeth stop hurting. I shared that in a school in-service the other day, and I had a janitor come up to me, and he said, uh, Dr. Beagle, um, you know you said your brother could make his teeth stop hurting with super glue? How do they do that? Because I got this really bad. At that same school, two women that work in the cafeteria came up to me, and they said because of district budget cuts, they were being mandated to take three days a month off which disqualified them for their health care plan. And they told me that they were told to go apply for the Oregon health care plan, which they did, and there they were told they made $12 too much. So poverty is an issue right here in our own backyard. Many people think they have to go abroad to fight poverty. It's right here. It's right here. Shifting our paradigm to think about what we can do. So at the University of Portland, when I started realizing we don't teach poverty in higher ed, I started looking for where are people learning about poverty? Because what I was hearing that people knew about poverty was primarily stereotypes. They get rich off welfare. How many people have heard that? It's a fundamental belief in our society. What's the facts? Okay, I'm going to ask you to compute in your head now, okay? In 1986, I was a single mom on welfare here in Portland, Oregon. My welfare check was $408. My rent on 83rd and Duke was $395. Who's good at math out there? What I have left, $13 plus $150 in food stamps. What I have to do with the $13? Utilities, transportation, go to the laundromat, $1.50 to wash, at least that to dry. Buy laundry soap, toilet paper, shampoo, all of the things you cannot buy on food stamps. 
When I got evicted from my house on 83rd and Duke, my welfare worker said, the state of Oregon is going to mandate you to a money management class. <laughs> I'd like to tell you that's a 23-year-old policy, but it's not. We're still doing that today. Nothing wrong with money management, but to say that to somebody who has $13, or to say to somebody, hey, if you can save some money, we'll match it. Thanks. So I started realizing people cared, but they didn't know. They didn't know our history. They didn't know the models that we've used to, to address poverty. How many of you know that we were winning the war on poverty? Johnson's war on poverty. We were actually winning. How many people know that? We reduced poverty nearly 23% when this nation focused on it. Poverty rates began to climb again when we diverted the funding out of the war on poverty and into the war in Vietnam. Poverty does not have to be. And it's certainly not okay. Melvin Tuman, a scholar from the 50s, said, the wider the gap in income in any given society, the less likely you are going to discover your talent in that society. How many Beethovens, Van Goghs, engineers, architects, musicians are we losing in that war zone of poverty? We can't afford it. We can't afford it. How many of you know that we are spending $1.6 billion in Oregon this year to cage human beings? That's our prison budget. About $30,000 per person. How many of you know that 80% of the people in our prisons cannot read at 8th grade level? How many of you know that there are cities in this nation where they determine when they do their 20-year city budgets, projections, they determine how many jail beds they need by looking at the reading scores of third graders in their community? Your third grader, you can't read, will be building your bed. We can do better. We can do better. We have to do better. Right now, we are number one in the world for caging human beings. China is now second to us. And if you're worried about your stocks, got a tip for you. You can now purchase stocks in America's prisons. And the people selling the stocks are lobbying at the federal and the state level for mandatory sentencing. We can do better. I don't know if, how many of you have been to a prison lately. Um, but unbelievable potential being lost. I was recently in the Pendleton prison where the guys there had carved, hand-carved this ship. And it's a teeter-totter for the kids to play on in the weight room. Beautiful piece of craftsmanship. They also built a clock that is phenomenal. It's right out in the lobby of, of the prison. Unbelievable talents and potential. So we can do better but we can't do better in ignorance. I've been saying for 18 years, before I die, I want it to be so that you cannot graduate from college without Poverty 101. Because we graduate people from college to be sociologists and psychologists and doctors and lawyers and judges, president of the United States, and they never have Poverty 101. How can you make good funding allocations without a deeper understanding of poverty? Now, I told you my welfare check in 1986 was $408. The average welfare check for one adult, two children today is $478. That's 23 years. $478. Oregon's is a little bit higher. I think it's about $520. But the average fair market value rent for a modest two-bedroom apartment is $750, according to HUD. HUD found one place in America, if you're making minimum wage, you can afford a modest two-bedroom apartment. Uh, it's not Portland. It's not even Oregon. It's a little town in Georgia. That's why we have so many families doubled up, tripled up. We have a, a wait list for housing so that the list isn't even open for getting help with housing if you don't have an income. These are the kinds of issues we have to put on the table as we're having dialogue in our community. What else can we do? How can we make sure that Oregon citizens, that Portland citizens are having authentic opportunities to, to move out and stay out of poverty. 
I dropped out of Marshall High School when I was 15, and I told a teacher there, I am so out of here. This stuff has nothing to do with me. I tell people all the time, I never met a soul who benefited from education. Never. And people will say to me, well, you knew your teachers. Being in the room with somebody isn't knowing them. I didn't know my teachers, and my teachers certainly didn't know me or what was going on in my world. And my teacher's comment to me was, you need to stay in school because one day you're going to want a job. Key concept here, meanings are in people, not words. What does a job mean if you're from my background? Two-thirds of the people living in poverty in America are working. That's the majority. And they're not just working. According to census, they're working 1.7 jobs. And we say work harder. I saw people work hard my whole life. My dad would work 16 hours, hard physical labor, come in the house, say to my mom, Ruth, did you want me to give all this to the landlord or keep a little bit back for groceries? So I looked at my teacher and said, I don't want a job. No, thank you. You know, we think people in poverty don't have work ethic. Why should they? You know, I worked my whole life. I worked in the fields. We'd make enough money for lunch. We'd go back in the afternoon. We'd make enough money for dinner. I worked in the pearl. It wasn't the pearl back then. Um, I worked at the Dayco foam rubber factory. I wrapped foam rubber for two years. Still got evicted. Still made choices. So being honest about what can somebody earn who's not educated? What can somebody earn who is not skilled? And then the flip side of that, how do we make sure people get skills in education? You know, one thing I'll say, uh, how smart I was as a kid depended on where I, what school I went to. And Oregon, back in those days, had some good schools. I think we're struggling today, moving away from a huge commitment to our future. But I would be, come to Oregon and I'd be put in school in Brooks or Mill City or Dufer or somewhere. And I would be way behind. And I would be there for a couple months and then we'd go back to Arizona and I'd be way ahead. I was a smart kid there. I got to be teacher's helper. <laughs> so focusing on the education in our communities is critical because we live in a, a labor market that requires education or a skill. And people who live in poverty are least likely to get either one of those. And if we don't talk about the stability of housing, you know, people in poverty die younger. They, they are sick more. I thought your cup, your teeth, I thought they belonged in a cup after the age of 30. I was astounded when I started having friends at the University of Portland who had parents who were in their 80s and had their own teeth. Really? You can do that? I didn't know. I didn't even know people lived past 60. And a lot of people believe the stereotypes. Well, they, they drink too much and they smoke too much and they don't take care of themselves. The federal government did a study of early deaths and found that 13% of the deaths could be attributed to drinking, smoking, and not taking care of yourself. A majority of the, dr of the deaths were attributed to living in polluted neighborhoods, working in unsafe jobs. The, the stress of poverty itself, the stress of poverty itself, which we know affects immunity now. So people are sick more. The, the lack of access to health care. I come from a world of no health care. Uh, if you get super sick, you go to the emergency room and you hope they give you samples. You know, we share antibiotics. My mom would say, I had this last year. You take it. You try it. It will make you feel better. Didn't know a thing about my body. Didn't know a thing about nutrition. See, a lot of people believe that there's not hunger in America because there's obesity. I was really proud of our governor when he and his wife lived on food stamps for a week. I was in Missouri at that time, and it was a national story. It even spurred two of our congressmen to live on food stamps for a week. And you know, I was proud because he raised the consciousness that, you know what, you get $3 per day per person. If you buy health food, you know that's not going to do it. You're going to eat what you can get. There's going to be a lot of starch, a lot of unhealthy food. So I do, I, I did really quickly realize that we aren't educating well about poverty. And I, I started looking, okay, where are people getting their information? And I found out it was the media. 
The number one way that Americans learn about poverty is the media. Now, I have to ask you, would you please raise your hand if you think the media dramatize and sensationalize? <laughs> what kind of stories are we going to know about the families in our community that are fighting that evil villain poverty? We're not going to know. We're not going to know what they go through in just one day just to, to get from one place to the other. I used to get my utilities shut off and I'd go to one organization and I'd say, can I get some help getting my lights turned back on? And they'd say, well, we could help you with $25 if you could find some other organizations to help you with the rest. You know, today when I work with organizations, I say, why are we asking people who are driving cars that shouldn't be on the road without gas money, no car insurance, to coordinate our social service system? We have the capacity to do that. I stand here today before you a fluke. I'm a fluke. I'm a fluke that I want institutionalized because the really wonderful, hopeful thing in America is we do know what to do. We do know what to do. I was really privileged. In 1986, I had my utilities shut off. I went to community action agencies. Community action agencies came out of the war on poverty. It is a model that works. They're often underfunded. They're often understaffed, but it is a solid model that works. I went to the community action agency where they told me there they would help me get my lights turned back on, and I might want to check out this new program that was starting up one month later. It was called Women in Transition. It was a pilot welfare to work program that piloted in seven counties in the state of Oregon. I was in group one. Thankfully, I was in group one, because group one got Section 8 housing. At that time, I was homeless with my six-year-old and two-year-old and my 15-year-old cousin who was also homeless. How much of my brain space was going for where are we going to sleep tonight? You know, Maslow was correct. It's a little bit difficult to think about getting a GED when you don't know where your head's going to lay and where your kids' heads are going to lay. And at that point in my life, I had the utilities shut off, and I had a 72-hour notice to move. I'd already gotten my once-a-year emergency welfare check, because you only allow one emergency a year if you're in crisis. So many of our programs don't match the realities of people's lives. So I was being evicted, and I couldn't live with my mom and dad. My, my dad was invalid. They lived in Barth's Trailer Court on 82nd Avenue. It was about a 10-foot trailer, and two of my brothers and their families lived there already. So I was about to become homeless. And a lot of people see me today, and they say, well, but you're determined, and you're motivated, and, and you're nice. So I really do have to take you back just a little bit. Um, let me give you a visual. 1986, a super bad permanent from my cousin. I was about 40 pounds overweight. Uh, my clothes came from clothing closets in church basements in really high poverty communities. So by the time they get there, their raggedy, holy, stained clothes you will be made fun of. I had attitude. I had smart mouth. Poverty teaches you that. Watch your family members not be treated well. See if you don't get an attitude. So there I was. And I called the phone number that the community action person gave me, not because I thought, oh, I'm going to change my life, but I didn't know what else to do. I drove by Pizza Hut, and I thought, well, I worked there, but I still got evicted when I worked at Pizza Hut. I was still making choices between rent and food because I couldn't get enough hours. So... I called the number, and I was so privileged, really, truly privileged to get into Group 1 of the Mount Hood Women in Transition program because they really did the things that I teach today. They took the time to get to know me. They began working on some of those Maslow hierarchy needs. And I was a pretty curled-up human being. I didn't think I was smart. I said ain't every other word. I didn't know when is it proper to say gone or went. How do people know when to say seen or saw? I didn't even know I wasn't speaking correctly. I just knew that no one could hear me, or no one thought I had anything to say because of the way I talked. So I get into this program. They, they started doing things like they told me to make a list of everything I did in one day. And they said, even if you pick up a shoe. So I wrote out my list, and I brought it in. And then they circled things on my list, and they showed me how there were professional job titles with job descriptions 
where those skill sets were needed to do those jobs, and then how much those jobs paid. And I'm looking at that thinking, man, if I could get that, I could really take care of Jennifer and Daniel. I walked out of that program every day feeling like, okay, there's no stopping me. It was a three-week life skills program, and luckily, Judy Giblin, the director, she had the sense to know that you don't interrupt generational poverty in three weeks. And for me, it was the first place in my life I ever found people who were making it, who took the time to get to know me, and who I felt cared. So when it ended after three weeks, I was crying. And the director said, Donna, we're not going anywhere. You need us, you call us. And I did for two years. For everything from what does this word mean to I, I don't have any way to get here or there or this crisis. And they would sit with me and they would talk me through it. They had a full resource backpack, good partnerships because they were a pilot program. And pilot programs, by the way, have almost 100% success rate. After 18 years of doing this work, I'm almost determined that we, everything should be a pilot. Because when we get a pilot program going, we get all the stakeholders at the table so it's not a fragmented approach. Oh, here's three-day box of emergency food. Good luck. Never mind, you're homeless. You don't have... It's a comprehensive approach. That's what Elizabeth Shore talks about in her book, Within Our Reach. If you want to eradicate poverty, you need a flexible approach that meets people where they are, not where we want them to be. And you need a comprehensive approach. Which means you need to see, if not you, then who attitude. As soon as people say it's not my job, they're not doing their job. It's got to be if not you, then who? And I find there are four organizations primarily that you come into contact with if you're in poverty. Justice, health, social service, and education. And these organizations are rarely talking. So there isn't that comprehensive approach. Um, I'm doing poverty institutes where I bring those four groups of folks together and we are really making some inroads in the communities where I work. Um, because when you say, oh, I can do this and I can do this and I can do this and the folks are really truly getting authentic opportunity, we're seeing incredible successes. So I got in that program and, and they said to me, well, what would you do for a living if you could do anything? And I said, I'll take Mary Hart's job from Entertainment Tonight. Now, they could have come back to me and said, Donna, you can't write a complete sentence. You think the whole page is a paragraph. You say ain't every other word. That's not a good plan. You need to think of something. They didn't. They came back to me and they said, Donna, you're interested in journalism. I'd never read a newspaper. I was 26 years old. I couldn't read the newspaper because I didn't know the words in there. And so they told me I had to, my assignment was I had to talk to somebody who was doing journalism. And they role-played with me and, and practiced with me how to talk to them. And I had to have a 15-minute conversation with them, and then I had to report back on it. Well, the first person I called was Pete Schulberg. How many of you ever heard of Pete Schulberg? How many of you know he's here? So 1986, I called Pete Schulberg out of the blue, and I said, I'm Donna Beagle. I'm a student at Mount Hood Community College. I'm interested in journalism. Could I come and talk to you for 15 minutes? Sure, Donna, come on down. So I go to Channel 8, and now me going to Channel 8, remember I'm from generational poverty, I spent 20 years of my life, 28 years of my life pretty much homeless. My five brothers and I spent our lives pretty much homeless. And so they didn't let people like us in places like Channel 8. And here I was being invited in. And Pete said to me, Donna, why don't you stay for a little while and watch the news, I'm getting ready to do the news. So I did. And then I sent him a card thanking him for his time as they gave me the cards and the stamps because I wouldn't have been able to do that otherwise. And then a couple of months later, I sent him another card and I told him I'd been accepted into the journalism program. And then a couple of months later, I sent him another card and I told him my first article had appeared in The Advocate at Mount Hood Community College. And my phone rang, and Pete doesn't know this part, but I had a lot of friends there from generational poverty and family members from generational poverty. And one of my friends answered the phone and she said, hello. I actually think she said Pat's Bar and Grill or something like that. But uh, she said, uh, she turned and looked at me and she said, Donna, the guy on the news, he's on your phone. <laughs> and Pete said, Donna, what are you doing? Could I buy you lunch? And he took me out to lunch and we've been friends ever since. 
And that was really the beginning of me be building an address book of people who weren't in poverty, who could navigate resources, who could expose me to possibilities. And I had the great privilege of having people like that come into my life. Um, now, I will tell you, group two of the Women in Transition program did not get any housing assistance. And when I would go back to speak to the groups, they would say, you got housing? Your mom watched your kids? I know my privilege. I'm not super smart. I'm not a better person. I'm not superwoman. I'm a fluke that happened in a place where a comprehensive approach was taken, where people truly met me where I was. I am the only family member who's not been incarcerated. All five of my brothers have been incarcerated. My dad, my uncles. Um, I come from deep, deep poverty. I am privileged, privileged to do the work that I do. I tell people I know way too much to be quiet. You know, Martin Luther King said if we're silent about race, there'll be racism. The same is true about poverty. If Portland doesn't talk about poverty, we can't eradicate it. It needs to be on our discussion tables, wherever we are. What are we doing? What else can we do? It has to be part of our efforts, because it's here. I went on to get my GED when I was 26, and I will tell you, I met a kid sleeping in the park, skate park in North Portland, and I told him I got my GED when I was 26. He said, man, I'm kind of glad to hear that, because I'm 17, and I thought it was too late. I see a senior with two credits. I don't say you messed up. I say, you got two credits? I'm so proud of you. Come on, you're getting a doctorate. Let's get started. And I believe it. I believe it. I, be I entered the University of Portland, and I had a professor there who became a significant mentor in my life. And mentoring really is the key. He said to me, I want you to learn a second language, Donna. And I said, what? And he said, Donna, when people speak incorrect grammar, they don't say a sentence, and then the next time say it differently. It's an explicit sentence structure. It is a language. And you can't learn middle class language if you're not dialoguing with somebody who speaks that sentence structure and uses those topics. So I am bilingual. I speak fluent middle class language. <laughs> and I speak my home language, which is a very different style of language. And I do a lot of trainings and education around, around communicating more effectively, because so often I see the messages crossing. I went on to get my master's degree from the University of Portland. I entered Portland State and did my doctorate in educational leadership, all focused on poverty education communication all focused on how can we increase the potential in our society. I now have two brothers who have bachelor's degrees, including uh, my one brother who spent most of his life in a cage. I have multiple cousins who grew up with illiterate parents who are entering graduate school. One of my cousins came to live with me when she was 15. No elementary school, no middle school. Took her four years to get a two-year degree at Mount Hood Community College. She followed my footsteps, identical. She went to University of Portland. She got her bachelor's. She got her master's. And this fall, she texted me and said, Donna, yikes, I've been, I've been invited into the doctoral program at Portland State. <laughs> we can make a difference. So I thank you, City Club, for taking this issue head on, for really having the conversation when we when we focus on poverty, we can't eradicate it. Thank you very much. Our first question today, as always, will be from our Board of Governors host. Our board host today is John Horvick. John Horvick is Project Director for Parents and Children Together Study at OHSU. Uh, he joined City Club in 2004. Uh, was a co-chair of the club's New Leaders Council in 2005 to 2008. He served on two uh, club research studies committees and is a member of the research board this past year. Uh, John Horvick has been a member of the Board of Governors since 2006. John. Thank you very much, Dr. Beagle. Um, you mentioned that you want everyone who graduates from college to take Poverty 101. Beyond that, if you were a um, a college of education dean. What would you change about how teachers are trained to be better prepared to teach students who are living in poverty? Well, I, 
I do believe that it is critical for teachers to get into the communities and to walk the walk of their students. In my book, I have uh, educators, social service providers, legal professionals, I just keynoted for the Minnesota State Bar, um, those different organizations that intersect with people in poverty, including business or people, just community members who want to make a difference, really get out in those communities and listen. Go to the places where people are. Um, so I, I think if you are a teacher and you haven't been to the communities, a lot of teachers commute in and they don't walk the streets, they don't know the streets, they don't know the organizations. So I will send them into a pawn shop and they have to pawn something and then ask, how much does it cost to get it back in 30 days? And they soon find it's 550% interest. Um, I will send them into a clothing closet so they see what kind of clothes the kids have access to. Um, so really I think it, it requires the education piece of understanding the history, but I don't think it's just educators. I think it's all citizens. All of those fields and it's all citizens. I just did a conference in Portland through my nonprofit called uh, Poverty Bridge. Uh, we did an opportunity conference for 200 Portlanders that live in poverty. And we spent the morning unraveling the shame that poverty teaches, and we spent the afternoon building their address book with citizens just like you who said, I'll give my phone number to somebody in the Opportunity Conference, and I'll help them brainstorm how to get around barriers and how to access opportunity. So I think that every one of us have to get involved, but I really do encourage a, a, a sincere focus on a, a getting a clear understanding that there are a lot of life experiences called poverty. There's situational, generational, immigrant, and each of those teach different messages messages to our kids and families. Okay, this is the time we open up our program to uh, questions from the audience. We invite anybody in the audience that wants to ask a question, Dr. Beagle, to do so. Please try to keep your question to 30 seconds or less and have a question mark at the end. We'll end at 1.15. John Leeper, City Club member. I am of the general opinion, rightly or wrongly, that there are different strata or levels of poverty. And with that in mind, I look at really documented and undocumented immigrants, other minority groups, and see a variety of different things that can and or should be done. I didn't hear you talk about any of this differentiation of the way that uh, these problems could or should be addressed. Well, you're, you bring up a really important point. Um, when people immigrate to the United States, they tend to do better in our schools, they tend to do better in our workplace, and I want to um, explain why. In third world countries, uh, and I've, I trained the entire justice system in Trinidad, Tobago, and, and I've worked in other countries where you, you don't see people saying to each other, if you just worked harder in this third world country, you wouldn't be poor. If you just made better choices in this third world country, you wouldn't be poor. So you don't have that constant pelting of something's wrong with you, something's wrong with you, where you end up feeling deficient. So a lot of people, and people in third world countries are taught that America is the land of... So they come here with a four-letter word, hope that's missing from America's poor. So part of my work is to, to clarify that. Now, I will tell you that in my, in my workshops and in my poverty institutes, which I'm going to be having one August 13th and 14th here in Portland, um, and you can find that out on the uh, Communication Across Barriers website, but we're going to be doing a two-day poverty institute. We do go deeply into that whole different life experiences that are put under that one word poverty, because if we try to address them all the same, it's not going to be effective. But it will be very clear that poverty crosses race. I went to do a keynote presentation, and on my way up to the stage, I picked up a flyer. There were 3,000 people in the audience, and the flyer said, Dr. Donna Beagle, an African-American woman who grew up in generational poverty. <laughs> Surprise. You know, and people say to me all the time, I read your bio, I thought you were Hispanic. I read your bio, I thought you were black. And I say, why? And they say, we don't hear stories like yours from blonde, blue-eyed people. Well, we are the majority. <laughs> Uh, proportionately within minority, popula within minority populations, there's a higher percentage in poverty, but in actual numbers, the majority of people on the streets are white, majority of people on welfare are white, the majority of people um, who, are, who are in poverty are white. So we have to recognize and fight poverty cross race, and we have to deal with the racism, because I rarely see people actually get to the racism piece because it's so confused with the poverty. 
J. Bloom City Club. Donna, one of your innovations is the whole concept of navigators. Could you expand a little bit about that work that you do in your poverty institutes? With uh, Poverty Bridge, my nonprofit, I designed the opportunity conferences in part so that I could work to increase the hope and help people see their strengths. So I'll do things like stand up if you can cut hair, stand up if you can fix a car. And pretty soon I've got 200 people who live in poverty who are standing and seeing that they can do things. Um, in the afternoon we match them with a navigator. Navigators are citizens. They're attorneys, they're uh, real estate folks, they're retired folks, they're bankers, uh, they're school superintendents who say, I want to go through Poverty 101 and I'll be a navigator. The navigators agree to give their phone number to someone in the Opportunity Conference and to call them and to help them to navigate opportunities and resources. And we had, uh, at this March 7th Opportunity Conference, our first uh, 32 navigators came from Lake Oswego. And it's just been amazing, amazing to watch the kinds of, of navigation that they're doing to help people who didn't know how to fill out a form or didn't know they could get financial aid or had no clue about what possibilities or opportunities are there. So we, through Poverty Bridge, and I'm excited to tell you that United Way has just offered Poverty Bridge, my new nonprofit space in the United Way building downtown beginning September 1. So I'm really... I'm really thrilled and thankful to Mark Levy from United Way. But we, we, we plan to do more opportunity conferences. We are going to need navigators. And all you have to do to be a good navigator is you have to be able to understand that no means ask somebody else. Um, because that's what we have to do to help people navigate resources and opportunity. Good afternoon. I'm Randy Hitz, City Club member. I'm also the Dean of the Graduate School of Education at Portland State. <laughs> and thank you for that first question. And Donna, we're very proud of you and we appreciate your work. Could you say something about the federal definition of poverty and how that has or has not kept up with inflation, please? Well, it's fascinating to, to when you start studying the, the real statistics of poverty. Uh, the federal government, the federal poverty guideline uh, for a family of four is, is right about $20,800. Are there any families of four in here? 20000 do it for you. <laughs> you know, if it seems low, it's because it is. It's based on a 1960s cost of living formula. That's how our, our government calculates poverty. In this formula in the 60s, they basically said, the economist said families spend one-third of their income on food. And they multiplied that by three, and they came up with a poverty threshold, and that was called our poverty guideline. And it's so important because it determines who gets food stamps, who gets Head Start, um, who gets access to resources. And so many people make $10 too much, and we know they need it. Um, today, the economists are saying families aren't spending one-third of their income on food. The bulk of the income goes to shelter. So if you really add in the issues of, of current cost in our society, uh, the Economic Policy Institute actually calculated in 2006 for a family of three uh, that they would need, if you added in child care and health care, you would need 30000 a year for a family of three. So it is a faulty guideline. It affects our schools. It affects our, our human resources. Uh, schools who get Title I money uh, often don't get what they truly need because their students aren't showing up, even though the school, the, the teachers, the, the administrators know that they absolutely need the support. So that is an issue. And, and they're actually having conversation at the federal level now about that, but it's not action yet. It's just talk. Um, <clears throat> Kurt Wavering, member. Um, let's see, I was just reading an article about um, debtors' prisons and such, and um, that America was basically settled by people who were debtors, like Georgia specifically, um, and when they got here, they decided that was not a good idea, and we've institutionalized other methods of dealing with that, closing debtors' prisons in 1832 and also having bankruptcy laws. Whereas uh, England, for example, continued, and you know Dickens was writing in the mid 19th century about such things. And, um, so my question is um, really around the the ethic of punishment, and you touched on it. I, I well, I guess this is a self-serving question, but uh, 
Wouldn't you think that punishment for people who are in poverty is a lost cause and that we need to find other methods like what you have? Absolutely. I mean, if we imagine, you know, we're spending 30000 a year per person to incarcerate someone. That's the national average. And imagine if we put that into our schools. <laughs> imagine if we told the teacher, you get 30000 a year to educate each kid. I mean, we can certainly do better. I know people who steal to pay their parole supervision fees because they know they're going back to jail anyway. I mean, we really do have to think this through. Are we setting people up for success? Project Clean Slate is an excellent Portland program that people are taking on all over the United States now where they will let people do community service in lieu of fines so they can get their license so they can actually get to work. 83% of licenses are taken away for non-driving offenses but for not being able to afford insurance kinds of things. We've run out of time and need to stop the question and answer session. Uh, club members, if uh, you haven't made your plans, please remember the annual meeting on uh, June 23rd. Next week we'll have Congressman Peter DeFazio and please uh, help me thank Dr. Donna Beagle who uh, I think did a uh, Poverty 101 class for all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>